My bad. Apologies, everyone. I did not realize I was on mute there. Hello and welcome back to the Red Path. Welcome to a slightly impromptu midweek live stream from myself and Dara. Um, I am going to be talking about a whole bunch of fun things tonight, but mainly it's going to revolve around my experience at the recent London Grand Tournament, better known as the LGT, and also um, the Broadsword Major, which I attended the week after the LGT. So... I had a pretty fun and hectic um, last couple of weeks, so it basically ended up being 13 games of Warhammer across a single week. I began um, by traveling over to London to play in the Friday Night RTT, which followed on with the main event um, over the Saturday and Sunday, which was really, really fun. And then this week and just gone, I was playing at the Broadsword Major in Mayo in Ireland, which was tons of fun as well. Um, I had a really good time. I ran two very different lists at both events, which we will get into in a little bit. But how it's going to go is I'm going to start by talking about the LGT, everything that happened there. And then we're going to transition to the Broadsword Major as well. Um, so if you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat. I'll get to them as I can and when I see them. I have some uh, questions from the Discord that were asked earlier today. And also, um, if you want to get your questions answered super chatting is the best way to do it but we will kick things off with the lgt and i'll talk a little bit about um, my overall experience at it first of all rather than necessarily the games themselves so the games were really really um fun but the event itself was actually really well organized now the lgt can kind of be a little bit controversial to some people who haven't necessarily been there because um you know, historically, it had like the styrofoam terrain scandal back in the day and, and lots of other bits and pieces. And it has certainly come a very, very long way since those days. And the LGT now is nowhere near what it used to be. It's improved drastically. And um, overall, it's a really, really nice experience. So the event itself, the main event had 760 people. Um, and there was loads of side events for like Age of Sigmar, and um, Horus Heresy, the Titan Owners Club were out there as well, doing some stuff there too, which was really cool. But yeah, overall, um, the event was really well organized. There was lots of different food venues, or food uh, food trucks basically at the side, which was great because you got lots of different options for, for your lunch break. Um, there was a really good Greek street food place that we went to a lot of the time because it was number one, very cheap, and number two, very delicious. But it was really cool because myself, Jamie, and Jack were all there. For the first time ever, we actually, as a channel, um, were all kind of together on the same continent, playing at the same tournament which had never happened before. So that was really, really exciting. It was great to hang out with the guys. And um, we met up with a lot of people over there, some people from the Red Path team and other world leader players, other content creators. You know, it was the usual kind of hype stuff that happens when you go to these major events. The vibe was obviously pretty crazy. That many people in one hall playing Warhammer was an intense experience um, in a really good way. And I would say my biggest criticism of the whole venue and the organization and stuff was that there was no side tables between the actual main tables. So unless um, you had like a convenient carry case or tray, you were kind of dumping your army in inconvenient places. So that was my biggest criticism of the actual event organization. So Let's get on to the games. Um, and what I'll do is I'll kick things off with the um, Friday Night RTT. So I almost missed my flight to London, which was tight. Um, but thankfully, I managed to, to make it there. And Jamie met me over in, in London and we, uh, we went to the venue with Jack um, to play in the Friday Night RTT. And that was really, really fun. So basically what we had done along with a few other team members was that we had essentially decided to all register for the same pod in the RTT. So there was pods of eight players um, across the, the day and we had all res registered for pod eight because of course we had, we were world leaders. So there was four world leader players and four non-world leader players in our pod. Um, there was Votan, Grey Knights, Tau, and Tyranids. And I matched Tyranids for game one. I have all my, my player names next to me here. So um, for game one, we had Matt. He was playing Tyranids and it was a really, really cool list. It had uh, double Norns in it, 
which I had never played against before. So it was really exciting to um, to play against them. And essentially in this game, Matt went... Uh, so to talk about the list as well that I brought as well, I brought the same list for the RTT as I did for the um, the main event, which was basically Angron, uh, Karn, Invocatus, two Masters of Executions, one with a Glaive, one with Favorite of Corn. There was um, a 10-man Berserker squad for the Glaive Mo, and there was a 10-man Berserker squad for Karn. Then there was a 5-man Berserker squad as well. There was uh, 6 Exalted 8-band, 3 Regular 8-band, 2 10-man Jackals, and a Rhino, which was, like, fine. It wasn't a, a massively interesting list, I don't think. But yeah, so I played into Matt with the, the nades in Game 1, and that was really cool because I was really excited to see what the Norns would do. There was, like, a Neurolictor and um, a bunch of other big beasties and things like that as well, which was really cool to see. So Matt went first and uh, very cleverly, essentially moved a line of gargoyles across the entire map so that I was completely screened out and um, kind of boxed me in for the first couple of turns. I obviously picked up all the gargoyles in turn one but I didn't really have much other places to go so then the Norns kind of came stomping into the board and I discovered very quickly that Norns are actually incredibly difficult to kill. So that was really fun um, running into them and, and battering them and stuff so I sent like a whole bunch of resource into one Norn in particular Took it down to like uh, one or two wounds, but it was still hanging on. It surprisingly doesn't do very much damage. So I was kind of like, okay, this is fine. And over the next turn or so, I was able to drag down the Norn on that flank while the other Norn was kind of essentially move blocked and wasn't able to get into the middle objective, which was where its feel no pain target was. Um, so I was able to wear that one down over time as well. A Hive Terran killed himself as well because his uh, psychic ability rolled a 1 in that game. So he died when he was only on 3 wounds left. That was pretty funny. Um, and Karen was an absolute terror in this game as well. Karen, as you'll see over the course of the LGT, was just really, really, really consistent. Very, very good. Um, Angron died pretty early in this game as well. He died in turn 1 or turn 2, I'm pretty sure. And he did not come back to life. And that is also a theme which is going to be consistent throughout the weekend as well. And part of the reason why I stopped bringing him the week after. But yeah, so that was game one. Um, because of the zone control that I was able to establish, I won that game 97 to 62. It was a really interesting fight and it was cool to experience the new Tyranids and what they could do. But ultimately, um, I was able to kind of control it a little bit better and position my resources in the right places. And some of my stuff just did a lot of work. So then I played into Matt again, another Matt with uh, the Grey Knights in this game which um, was very, very interesting because um, Grey Knights are a really interesting challenge. They do a lot of teleportation around the map. But this is a problem for a lot of other armies, but not really so much for the World Eaters because we are very, very fast. So we're kind of able to get around the Grey Knight teleportation by constantly having speed buffs up. Now, one key thing that happened in this game was that I got a lucky charge off pretty early on which allowed my Exalted 8-bound and Angron to collapse in on his deployment zone objective, uh, picking up a Paladin squad, a Strike squad, and a bunch of other stuff. Um, that was pretty impactful because it took out a lot of key resource as well. And whenever he was kind of teleporting around, it was fine because I was generally able to rapid response move towards things. And whenever I was doing my movement forward, I was essentially setting up moves where, sure, he could pick up one unit, but I was always setting it up that if he picked up one, I would have another one that I could charge instead. So it was always a difficult choice who he was going to pick up and put in teleportation strike. So that was kind of fun. Um, I actually really enjoyed the play pattern of the Grey Knights. They have a lot of cool tricks that I haven't really seen in any other armies in 10th edition. And I'm kind of interested to actually play them myself. I just found that their damage output is really, really lacking. And that is probably the biggest thing that was holding them back in this game. So I won that one. Um, very squeaky win. Uh, 75 to 70, just about pulling through. Meanwhile, I believe at this point, Jack and Jamie were playing each other on a table. But I'll let them cover that one because that was a funny game. Um, so then it goes into game three, the, the finals of the RTT, which I am actually playing on the top table. And I'm playing Marcus and his Tau. So this was a pretty fun game, I guess. Um, hello, Rain as well. Hello, everyone in chat. Good to see you all all chatting away. Um, I, I'll touch into chat as I can. But if you have any questions about the games as we're going on, do, do let me know and I will get to them as I can. But yeah, so game three of the RTT, Marcus with the Tau. Um, it was a fairly standard Tau list. You know, there was a uh, Hammerhead, 
a lot of battle suits, a lot of crisis suits, all the kind of things that you would kind of expect out of a tower list, which probably has more units than it should. Um, Marcus was a very, very good player. I think he was current or former Team England and did a really good job of boxing me into uh, the deployment zone quite early since he went first, um, which was fine. But a couple of uh, blood surge mistakes from him kind of cost some units, which brought the game kind of back into my favor. And at about the midpoint, I made a big gamble where I basically brought Angron in from rapid ingress in an area where he was able to be shot by a single crisis suit squad. And I was kind of like, okay, if you don't pick up Angron with this squad, which you're sort of unlikely to do, I will probably win this game because in my turn, he's just going to move into your lines and wreck face. Um, and he didn't pick up Angron with his squad, which I was like, okay, cool. Unfortunately, though, in my next turn, he overwatched with the hammerhead after I moved Angron and did roll a six and did kill Angron in overwatch, which, you know... It's one of the many reasons why I'm kind of like, maybe Overwatch shouldn't be in the movement phase. But anyway, that was a little bit sad. So things kind of collapsed after that. I wasn't able to really gain any more momentum. And Angron obviously didn't come back to life as well. So I did end up losing that game, um, 56 to 90. I just wasn't able to keep control of the game after that gamble, unfortunately, didn't pay off. I was banking quite hard on that working out, as I kind of had to in the Tau game, because... It is just a very, very difficult matchup for us. Um, so yeah, unfortunately didn't win that one, but that was not too bad. So after that, we all went out and we got food together, which was really nice and had a whole bunch of beers as well, which was really fun too. Um, coinciding with me waking up on Saturday morning for the LGT main event, slightly hungover, but that's okay. Um, so yeah, walking into the big hall, obviously huge energy. The, at this point, everyone had arrived for the main event. You know, we were chilling outside Ja oh no, it was the Friday night Jack's bag strap broke and his whole army got immolated, but I'm sure he'll talk about that when he gets around to it. Um, so yeah, that was that. And basically, yeah, my first game in the main event was against Mike and his Death Guard. Now this was a, I would say, somewhat unconventional Death Guard list. I'll go into these games in a little bit more detail, mainly because it was the LGT main event and that's kind of what people want to hear about. So if you have questions about them during the games, do let me know. But um, this deck guard list had triple plague burst crawler, um, double predator las cannons. It did not have mortarian. It had a lot of terminators. It had the guy who allows them to ignore the indirect stuff. And what else did it have? A lot of pox walkers. It had typhus. Um, and that was pretty much it. So no plague marines, no mortarian. So I was kind of feeling a little bit confident going to this matchup. I would say potentially even overconfident. So I managed to go first, which was great. And my whole plan was because of how he deployed, I was going to rush hard, um, try and get through all the pox walkers in turn one and tag the exalted eight bound into some units behind them, which would maybe mean that they weren't going to be able to fall back if they failed their leadership test, which was a bit of a gamble, of course. But, you know, um, if they tag two units, they're statistically likely to fail one of those tests, which was fine. So... I sent the Exalted 8-bound forward along with Angron and the regular 8-bound, and he overwatched with his Death Shroud uh, Terminators, which I thought were only 9-inch Flamers, but they're actually 12. Um, now, not to be like, oh, you know, this was a little bit dodgy or whatever, but um, he had a Terminator Sorcerer attached to that squad, who once per game can power up his own weapons and make them better strength and better damage. Now, unfortunately, in this game... Um, my opponent played it that he could actually power up the entire Death Shred squad, which is not how the rule works and not what I knew at the time because I'm not that familiar with Death Guard. So yeah, basically he picked up five Exalted 8 Bound in, um, in Overwatch, which was really, really rough. Um, even if it wasn't necessarily how the rule was supposed to be played, it just, it's one of those things. It is what it is. Um, and then Angron, the remaining 8-bound, uh, all got into combat and picked up all the Poxwalkers and Typhus, which was pretty okay. So basically, the first turn for the deck guard was kind of like, can you kill Angron in a single turn? Because if you don't, it's going to be a massive problem. He didn't kill him with shooting. He didn't kill him um, with the first round of combat. I think he sent in Blightlord Terminators, and he barely killed him with um the death shroud he killed him on the very very last attack so angron died in the first turn but it did take his entire army which meant that i was fairly well positioned to 
launch a strong counter threat, uh, uh, counter attack. So I brought out a lot of um, the Berserkers. I brought out the Glaive Mo. I brought out um, the remaining 8 bound that I had. And basically the rest of my resources, Karn came in from reserve, actually managed to hit a charge from reserve as well, which was pretty cool. And the Glaive Mo went through a lot of Terminators over the next uh, turn or two. The Fight Force was really, really impactful here. And the massive damage from the Glaive was just powering through all the Terminators. I was getting a lot of sixes because they all had characters in the squad. So basically, my thinking for this game as well, I forgot to say something quite important, was that Mike had taken fixed secondaries. And uh, those were Engage and Assassinate, I want to say. Um, I knew he was going to get a lot in Assassinate, but I knew if I box him in, for into his deployment zone i'd be able to almost zero him on engage so that was my game plan going into it um so yeah my second wave hit pretty hard and his response to that also hit me pretty hard i kind of lost a lot of resource as well but at this point we were kind of getting to around the bottom of turn three and neither of us really had a whole bunch left on the table but i had managed to basically prevent him from scoring engaged at all another thing that happened was that he was playing his blow drones as a two-up armor save which they're definitely not and it was really impactful because karen didn't kill the blow drone that he charged and then the blow drone killed most of that squad and i don't want to be better about it but i'm definitely a little bit better um but anyway that's fine and and it's fine because Angron came back to life in this game um and he came back to life and he literally picked up the game carried it on his shoulders and won it for me um so i won that game 81 66 simply because angron at the end of the game was just bouncing between different units slapping them all um doing a whole ton of damage getting a load of objectives as well and yeah it managed to to keep me in the game um i think i only gave him like maybe four points on engage which was fine and yeah things went well for me in that one so win in the first round was really nice and then i moved into game two and i was playing into gsc for this one so GSC was another army that I had. I think I had maybe played one game against them in 10th edition. So I was kind of like a little bit spooked as to um, what they were going to do to me. I wasn't really too sure. So I kind of deployed in a, a slightly passive, slightly aggressive way where depending on if I went first or second, Invo could either pregame a lot of guys back into cover or into a, an aggressive stance depending on what I needed to happen. Um, I went second in this game and I basically used the scout moves to essentially null deploy. So he couldn't shoot anything. So this is important. This is really important. So pay attention. Uh, the only thing he could shoot in my army was Angron. And he could only shoot him with like one squad of neophytes. And that was literally it. And I was like, okay, cool. I'll put up the move, bo move boost um, blood dice because, you know, I'll be able to capitalize on the movement in my first turn, which is nice. And I won't need the feel no pain because Angron literally can't die to 20 neophytes. Or so I thought. It turns out he can die to 20 neophytes when you only roll ones on your armor saves and auto guns will kill you, um, which was really rough. So Angron died and he exploded in my lines and killed two exalted eight band and half a jackal squad which was tight. So the first thing that I did before my first turn was I went to the bar and I got myself and Adam a pint because I said, this game is going to be fast and it's going to be funny. So let's have a good time. And we did have a really good time, but I got the door kicked in. It was super rough. Adam got every single respawn roll for his, um, for his GSC. Like they were all like three pluses or, or more. And he got them all. Everything came back to life, except for Angron, who didn't come back to life, which was tight. Um, so I got absolutely hockeyed in that game. It was 37.91 to Adam. Adam was a really, really good player. I don't want to make it sound like it was like bad luck or anything. Um, that the reason I lost the game, his board control was phenomenal. Like I was boxed in so, so quickly. There was like almost nothing I could do. Um, yeah, so that, that was really rough. Um, right. I see saying people need to learn their rules before a tournament like the LGT. I kind of agree. Um, you know, the deck guard game, I didn't really feel bad about it until some of my friends pointed out that, like, quite a few things he was doing was illegal and always in his favor. Um, and it's always when stuff like that happens that I'm kind of like, hmm, that's a little bit strange, but whatever. Um, so, yeah, that was that. And anyway, Adam hockeyed me in that game, 37 to 91, like I was saying. It was really fun playing against GSC. They were a really interesting experience, I would say um very overwhelming having not played them before but i feel like i would go into the next game feeling a bit more confident understanding how they kind of operate um and their go turn was really big when they all popped up they did a lot of damage to me and i kind of 
you know learned that uh demo charges are terrifying so that was that was pretty funny um anyway that was that game so the next game i played into joe who was playing custodes now for anyone who may already know um i actually played on war games live for this game which was really really cool so you know i i had a lot of time between round two and round three so i had a, a you know a reasonable few alcoholic beverages and i kind of hung out with jamie and jack we we're chatting about how their games were going and stuff and i arrived back at, at my table to move my my stuff to the next one and i saw that there was some war games live thing on the on the battle mat and you know being the brain that i have i kind of said oh you know that's probably nothing to do with me and i just walked away um and after a little while one of the uh, referees came down and said hey did you know that you're supposed to be on war games live um and i did not know that but yeah so went up there uh, myself and joe went up to joe of war games live had a little bit of a chat beforehand which was really really cool and yeah um for anyone who watched the stream uh the custodes game was rough for the custodes player um it was over very very quickly because we were um, playing search and destroy deployment which is the quarters so the shortest deployment zone for world leaders and i am very very confident in the custodes game i've played them an awful lot i know how to beat them and i knew in this game if i went first i was picking up a caladius grav tank which i did um so the grav tank went away as angron moved 22 inches across the board and i said to myself if he doesn't kill Angron in this first turn, the game is absolutely over. And he failed to kill Angron, um, which meant the game was over because then Angron killed the other Caladius. Now, uh, Joe was a really, really good sport about it. Um, he was ultimately quite new to the tournament scene. Um, I don't think he'd been to very many tournaments before, maybe only two or three. So it was obviously a really big experience for him, especially playing on stream, which can be quite a, a nervous kind of thing to do. Um, and I know, you know, Joe maybe got a couple of rules wrong, but it was not really a big deal at all in the game. I know some people kind of gave him gave him some flack for that on stream, which I think is unwarranted. Um, we worked everything out in the end and it was all fine, but it was a really fun game. And I think after kind of the first couple of turns, I tried to angle it to be a bit more of a fun experience to watch since we were playing on stream rather than necessarily a hyper competitive game. Um, and yeah, we had a lot of fun. It was it was really enjoyable. But yeah, I did kick the uh, kick the Castells about the place a little bit. So that game ended ninety five to fifty six. Um, Gabriel, I see you saying the the Castells game was a slaughter. Yeah, it was. It was. Um, it was really rough. And yeah, War Boss, I agree. You can't memorize all your stats and and all your rules and stuff like that. And the Castells game was the same as well. Joe didn't necessarily remember all his rules, and that's entirely fine. People don't play the game as much as as I do. But um, yeah, you know, it's just what it is. Um, so that was that game. And that was day one of the LGT. Really fun to play on stream. I really enjoyed the experience. And uh, a lot of people ask me kind of, you know, did you feel nervous or anything? Not at all, because, um, you know, I do stuff like this kind of semi-regularly. So I definitely think that that had a large impact in terms of my confidence going into the game. Um, not being nervous about playing, you know, on a stream table or anything like that. And Joe was... Um, was really really great about like everything he's just a really good guy um and i can't shout out enough i uh, can't say enough about joe you know so if you're not already following war games live or or commenting on their streams or joining in when they're live go go and follow them joe is doing some really really phenomenal work um yeah oh wait yale you love the custodes game first 10 game you watched and it was really nice i thought it was really nice too i really enjoyed joe as an opponent he was a really nice guy and I felt a little bit bad about what happened. But um, yeah, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, I think we had a lot of fun together. And I feel like halfway through that Jay, uh, that game, Joe kind of got my vibe, I would say. And we, we started messing around, doing silly things that, you know, like we were opening down the back of the Corona Scrab tank and putting my berserkers inside there and, and things like that, which was funny. Um, so yeah, ultimately it it kind of became a fun game rather than necessarily a competitive game which isn't always what people want to see at the lgt live stream you know but um if i double down and really applied the pressure in a way that would have like ended the game in turn two it would have been a really unenjoyable viewing experience and you know i knew there was probably people from the red path watching so i wanted to make it fun and, and interesting to watch for them too so yeah, day one. Day one was pretty good. I finished two and one um, and I was semi-confident going into game four, which was my favorite game of the tournament. So I had matched into Thousand Suns. 
Um, and we were all kind of sitting at the pub the night before, you know, talking about the matchups and how we were going to play our games. And I was feeling reasonably confident because my opponent, um, who was James, he was bringing uh, a sort of interesting Thousand Suns list. It had Magnus, it had um, a bunch of Rubric squads, one 10 man Flamer, and a few five mans. And it had a 10 man Scarabacul squad as well with the attached Sorcerer, which interestingly wasn't the teleportation one, it was on the Flamer squad. And I was kind of thinking like, okay, cool, this game is this game is quite winnable. Um, I know pretty much everything that this list wants to do. I just have to play it well. Uh, so I arrived at the table and, you know, got talking to James and very quickly realized from our initial pregame chatter that this guy had his head screwed on. Um, he was asking me all the right questions about my army and I got a feeling that he understood his army very, very well. So in this game, um, it was... It started off and I went second. Yeah, I went second in this game. And Joe, or sorry, James pushed out in a really interesting way where he didn't really give me a whole bunch. But because of the tactical objectives that he drew, he drew Assassinate and Area Denial. So he had to actually move his Mutelet Vortex Beast into the middle of the board um, using Temporal Surge on it. So he wasn't really able to fire at anything too interesting. But he did use the once per game precision from the Demon Prince to rinse Avocado with the Terminator squad, who uh, promptly disappeared, which was a little bit sad. So that was kind of the opening salvo. And I responded with a really interesting play. So I had kind of done my null deploy scout move where I just ran back into the ruins. And I realized that James had sort of overextended his Terminator squad just a little bit, maybe like four or five inches too much. So I saw an opportunity for Glavemo and his 10 Berserkers to flank in alongside the Rubric squad with the Flamers and charge the Terminator squad. And I had also drawn Assassinate in this turn. So I knew that that would be huge if I was able to body slam the Terminator squad early in the game because he would have essentially had to deal with those Berserkers in his second turn, which would have been quite a difficult thing to do because... I was also planning on hitting the Flamer Rubric squad with three regular 8-bound and a Jackal squad and some Berserkers. Um, unfortunately, though, he overwatched the Glavemo squad with the Flamers in the movement phase. And we'd been talking about that move as it was about to happen. And, and essentially, there was no possible way, even with a 6 on my advanced roll, that I could not end one Berserker on an objective which meant that he was going to have full wound rerolls with the Flamer Bomb. Um, and he picked up nine of the Berserkers, which was seriously, seriously rough. Um, unfortunately for him, Glavemo showed up and killed the Sorcerer and four Terminators. So that was kind of a little bit tit for tat. And all the Flamer rubrics died except for the Teleporting Sorcerer, um, thanks to the pressure that I put on there. So that was a pretty solid turn for me. Karn and his squad actually charged the Mutilate Vortex Beast in the middle of the board and they didn't kill it but they hurt it pretty bad so james responded in an interesting way where he brought the demon prince out to deal with karen squad the sorcerer teleported away in front of barney which was uh barney one of my my jackals which was pretty funny and then magnus came out to play um so when he put magnus down and i saw where magnus was going to be setting up for the rest of the game i rapid ingressed angron behind cover so angron was going to have a pretty long move to get to magnus in the next turn but he would be entirely safe from him in this turn. So, you know, James hit back pretty well. Um, the Demon Prince actually whiffed it into Karen, and then Karen's squad picked up the Mutilid Vortex Beast and the Demon Prince and kind of ended up dominating the center from there on. And Magnus basically picked up the remains of the flank that had kind of been my initial first push, killing the Mo, the 3 8 bound, the 5 man Berserkers, all that kind of stuff. So that was that. Um, and then, yeah, basically. I had to make a very, very long move with Angron to get into Magnus, and I just about pulled it off, but I had to multi-charge the remaining Terminators as well, um, as well as Magnus. And unfortunately, Angron only did 10 damage to Magnus. So I got four saves through. He used the Cabal points to auto, or sorry, to reroll one. He used the CP to reroll one, and he auto zeroed one. So in the end, I actually only got, um, I think it was two saves that he failed. And I did 10 damage across those two, um, which I was like, okay, this is pretty big and pretty bad. 
Um, but then Magnus swung back and only took 10 wins off Angron. So I was like, okay, maybe it's not going to be too bad. And then randomly the Scarabacal Terminators killed Angron, which I was like, okay, now things are definitely bad. The Exalted 8-bound had also come in from reserve in this turn and failed an 8-inch charge um, as they were next to Angron. So that was a little bit sad too. So basically he had in turn, I want to say four, three or four, he had um, Magnus still alive, I didn't have Angron, and he had some Terminators alive as well. So there was a really interesting play where I had Karn and the guys in the middle objective, kind of like here, and I had the Exalted 8-bound down here. So he brought Magnus and the Terminators to about this point, keeping them 7 inches away from Karn and his Berserkers, because he didn't want them to Blood Surge into them. Um, and basically his plan was to shoot the crap out of the Exalted 8-bound, uh, damage Karen's squad a little bit and then charge the Terminators into Karen's squad and Magnus into the Exalted 8 band. Except because he had moved the 7 inches away from Karen's squad to make sure he wasn't surged into, he actually ended up failing the charge, which meant Magnus had to go into Karen's squad and Magnus didn't kill them all and then Karen killed Magnus, which was huge. It was a massive turning point in the game. So then in my turn, um, the one remaining Exalted 8 band got overwatched and died. And essentially, Karen charged the remaining Terminators and got locked in combat for a little while. Um, so the game ended with basically nothing left for either of us. And it was really, really, really tight. So it had ended with me scoring uh, 93 points and James scoring 88, which was... No, sorry, 91 points for me and James scoring 88, which was obviously a three-point win. Extremely, extremely close. So after this game, I had to go and put my army on display for Best Painted. And while I was up there, um, I got talking to Jack, who uh, was, you know, up there helping me as well. And he let me know that I had actually made a mistake in that game. I had um, accidentally cheated. Oh, my God. Red Pat cheats. And that it had basically gotten me the three points to win the game. I won't get too much into the details about it, but I had no idea that the play that I'd made was wrong. Essentially, the discard thing with the stratagems. I didn't know you could only do it once per game. Anyway, it had caused me to draw a secondary, which got me the extra points. So I went back to the table, sorted it out with James. Um, I couldn't take the win based off that. It just didn't feel correct at all. And we went up to the judge and we were able to get the score changed to 88 to 88, which is the perfect score. And honestly, I must say, James played an insanely good game. Um, it was so, so tight. And a draw is honestly the fairest outcome that I think could have happened from the game. I think we both played really, really well. But ultimately, neither of us necessarily got the better of the other, and the draw ending with or the game ending with a really high scoring draw feels really representative of how the game should have ended. Um, it was my favorite game of the LGT, beyond doubt. It was really, really good, really enjoyable, and I'm really glad that you know we were able to get the score changed um, and that things ended up the way they did because it was really fun. So. That was game four. Um, at this point, I was 2-1-1, which is fine. And I played into Robin Crudace, um, one of the lead rules designers of GW for the final game, and his sister. So let's talk about that one after I momentarily get a bit of water. So. Karen needs to chill, Jay. Yeah, for sure. Karen was on a mission all weekend, for sure, for sure. Um, Yale says War Games Live commentators said it's important to showcase fun games as well as very competitive ones. Absolutely. Um, I think the fun games are, are really, really good. And Bron, as he said, no such thing as a perfect game of 40k. That's absolutely true. But I think in this instance, when I realized that something a mistake that I had made had changed the score differential by such a small margin, um, I, I, I just wasn't really comfortable with with that outcome and i was much more comfortable with the outcome that inevitably did happen so yeah i played into robin critics for the last game with a fairly unconventional i would say sisters list it was kind of like the best way i can describe it is it's the type of list you would expect a gw employee to bring to a tournament where it was kind of like yep it's got a little bit of everything and it doesn't really seem to do anything which was interesting um we actually played the wrong primary in this mission as well. We were both very tired and Robin just said, this is the primary and I didn't question it and it was not the primary, but that's fine. Um, I had a very, very strong opening half of this game. Angron made good progress across the board pretty early on and um, he had sort of misdeployed Morvan Val in her uh, her Paragon Warsuits, which allowed the um, 
the exalted ape bound to rush them in turn one and pick them all up morvin val resurrected and then even though he put probably three quarters of his army into the exalted ape bound in the next turn they did not die two of them stayed alive killed the sacristans that um that had run into them and they went on to basically chew through an awful lot of resources which was just crazy like it was they shouldn't have been able to do that but they did um i'm sorry if i'm the reason that exalted ape bound get nerfed in the balance pass in january because robin was definitely unimpressed with their behavior um angron meanwhile tanked an arcoflagellant squad that had run into him and actually surprisingly on the sweep picked them all up even though they've got two wounds and a four up field no pain which is really unlikely to happen but it did happen so then he went on to charge a castigator and morvan val who had resurrected he made sure she didn't resurrect again um and then he killed the castigator as well so i had like insane control in the first two to three turns but robin had deep struck a lot of stuff in my back line and there was some other scoring stuff going on on one of the flank objectives that I just couldn't seem to win out that flank. The Glavemo squad kind of came in a little bit late to the party and over the course of a couple of turns they hacked through a lot of stuff but they also took a lot of damage from the Retributors. Um, Karen meanwhile just cleaned up a flank all by himself with the Berserkers and just decided to squat on an objective for the rest of the game. So in the latter half of the game, I would say Robin was kind of getting the upper hand because I was sort of running out of resources. A lot of my resources were on objectives that I had conquered but couldn't leave um, or in his deployment zone. And I did not pull a capture enemy outpost or behind enemy lines, which is annoying. And he did. And he was on my deployment zone. So it was, yeah, it was a really close game. Um Ultimately, the score that was registered was 93 to 94 to me. Um, so winning by a single point. If we had played the right primary, it actually would have been uh, an 11 point differential. So I think it was 94 to 81 or 82 or something. So I, I suppose, it, you know, it, ultimately it doesn't really matter all that much. But yeah, it was an interesting game. Um, he played not a bad game Warhammer for someone who I thought might be not so good at the game. But uh, yeah, it was it was kind of interesting. We didn't really, you know, chat too much about it afterwards. I think he was very, very tired at that point in the weekend, and so was I. Um, but that did finish my run at the LGT. So ultimately, I finished up going uh, three wins, one draw, and one loss. And that placed me 140th out of 760 players, which was uh, much better than what I had been anticipating um, I also managed to pick up third in the best painted army category, which was really, really nice too. Um, I was super chuffed about that. I didn't think I would place because the armies that were on display were exceptionally good quality this year, uh, much more so than I've seen before at other tournaments. So I was really chuffed about that. Got a nice little medal and a nice little certificate as well. Um, but before I move on to talk about the Broadsword Major, which I went to the week after because I just can't get enough 40k. If there's any questions that people have in the chat about the LGT, now would be the time to ask them. I'm just going to have a quick sip of water while people think about that. But yeah, before, before we move on, ultimately, my takeaways from the LGT was that it was really, really hype. I would say um, if I was to compare it to the LVO, it was like thousands of times better in terms of... Um, consistent terrain in terms of the level of player skill there i i really love that all the people i played against um were fairly similar in competitive level like there there wasn't too much of a gap which was really really nice um and some of the games really challenged me in a good way in a really really good way and obviously meeting jack and jamie over there and, and a whole bunch of other people Liam and Ross, see you hanging out there as well. We had graduate from the team too. And a bunch of other World Leader fans who just kind of came over to hang out, which was really, really nice. Um, so, yeah, let's see what's going on here. Uh, Don saying you love me. I love you too, Don. I wish you had been uh, refing my deck card game because that would have made things a little bit easier. Um, am I coming to Nottingham in January? I'm not sure yet. Uh, so I've got Coventry in November. And then I'm thinking about taking a little break for a couple of months because I've been to like, 10 or 11 uh gt plus events this year and it's been really fun but it's also been really expensive <laughs> so you know um there is that i might go to knots um jay i said about staying on objectives that i couldn't move away from uh did i not have the cp for the sticky strat 
Um, the sticky strat you only can do when a unit dies on the objectives. So I find myself stickying objectives with jackals a lot, but I very rarely use that stratagem, mainly because I need my CP for typically the plus one to wound stratagem or the auto six advance. Um, I've used that stratagem maybe like two or three times across the two tournaments that I was at over the last couple of weeks. What was the painting quality like? It was really good. Um, the painting quality at the LGT was the highest quality that I've seen at any event that I've been to. There was a, um, a Tyranids army that was like insanely converted. It was all this like Xenomorph stuff going on. I can't even begin to explain. Like it was just so, so good. Um, Mohogmanes had showed up with his knights. There was the usual masochist Imperial Fist players who love painting yellow. Um... There was a Necrorc army, a really, really well converted Necron army, converted to be like scrap orcs. There was just tons of really cool and unique armies. People had showed up and I was really surprised to get third. I don't think I necessarily deserved it, uh, but I got it, so it's fine. We all know that Vegas is better than London as a city. I mean, yeah, to be fair, where the LGT is on, it's not in London City. It's like a little bit outside. Um, as someone in Nevada, I would rather be in London 80% of the year. That's fair. <laughs> That's fair. Yeah, I just thought that, like, you know, outside of the venue itself, the organization was much better at the LGT. The people who were playing at the LGT, at least from my experience, were a lot more pleasant to play against. They were, um, for the most part, a lot more familiar with their rules. And as is the case with all UKTC events, people generally tend to be quite above board and quite play by intent it's just like how people play over there which is really really nice and you know i've been to a lot of uktc events the lgt just reinforced my love for them so that's how that's going to be but yeah so um that was the lgt feel free to keep chatting away as well and asking more questions i'll get to them as i see them and all that kind of good stuff but i will pivot to talking about um the big change that i made for the broadsword major so after the after the LGT, um, I was chilling with Jamie at, at his mom's house, of all places. Um, I had a lot of time to kill the day after. And we were kind of both talking about how Angron was not doing it for us anymore. Um, for a couple of different reasons. Angron's play pattern, and, and this might be a little bit controversial, but Angron's play pattern doesn't really require a lot of skill to get decent results um perfect example was the custodes game i played on stream so you can go and watch that back if you want because basically as i said he it didn't take any skill to move him 22 inches in the first turn and kill a uh, a Caladius. and it didn't take me any skill to just roll the saves that i rolled so that he survived in the first turn um and ultimately, when those two things happened, the game was immediately over. Um, there's no way you can come back from Angron living in your deployment zone for more than one turn of the game. So that was that. Um, his play pattern is kind of the same in almost every single game, regardless of your opponent. Like, he doesn't really do anything interesting for me anymore. He just runs forward, he kicks the crap out of something, and he dies. And across the entire LGT, across all eight games, Angron came back to life once for me, which felt pretty bad. Um, I had built redundancy to bring him back. I had the favorite of Corn Mo. I had five banners, which were generally on objectives, and I just didn't get him back. And Jamie also had a lot of redundancy and brought Angron back once over the entire weekend. And we both just felt pretty bad about the whole thing. Um, Rin's question. Thank you for the super chat, Rin. Hard hitting question. Where were the Krieg undies and why were they not on? The Krieg undies are lost in Vegas. Another reason why I hate Vegas. Because uh, Vegas Airport, uh, Vegas International, lost the underpants that were gifted to me with my face on them. Um, but yeah, so going back to it, basically, we were kind of coming to the conclusion that Angron wasn't really a good expression of skill in terms of his use. He He wasn't very fun to play after a while like he's really really fun at the start when you just like fly him around the place being like whoa here we go it's anger on time um but after a while it's kind of like oh he just he just does the same thing the whole time so it gets a little bit boring and yeah we were kind of like wondering how we could make something viable that wasn't an anger list 
So we were playing around with the idea of demon princes as like mini Angrons. So Jamie was playing around with a concept of running one with a berserker glaive. And I was thinking about running one with the uh, brazen helm. Now, um, both of these are very controversial units. People historically, since the index has dropped, have not liked the demon prince. But I kind of started coming around to him because essentially taking out Angron and taking out the favorite of Korn, Mo, um, means that you get around 520 points in your list, which is enough for uh, Exalted 8-Bound and some other stuff. It's enough for uh, Terminators. It's enough for a lot of interesting things. So I was building a list for the Broadsword Major. Um, with this in mind, I just I kind of hard committed after the LGT. I just said it to Jamie. I'm not going to bring Angron um, because it's, it's just not interesting. And I wrote a list based on the models that I had. It's not the list that I would have wanted to bring. And it's not the list that I'm going to bring to the Coventry Super Major in November. But it was a winged demon prince with the brazen helm. It was Karn, Invocatus, and the Berserker Glaive Mo. Um, now, there is an argument for putting the Berserker Glaive on the demon prince. But it means that the Mo then doesn't really have a good enhancement to take. Which kind of reduces his viability. And then reduces the viability of the 10-man squad. While a lot of the time... And I'm not saying all the time because it's not true, but a lot of the time you don't necessarily need the Berserker Glaive on the winged Demon Prince to get the job done, as long as you pick your Oath of Korn target correctly. So yeah, and I kind of figured that the Brazen Helm having damage was going to be a little bit obnoxious. Um, so that was my HQ selection. Then I had two five-man Berserker squads, one for the Glaive Mo, because I also realized I don't need ten Berserkers to go around with the Glaive Mo. Almost always, that's overkill. Um, so I put five of them there. I had five pretty much with nothing, um, no attachment. I mean, they could have had an attached character, but, you know, um, they were generally, they didn't. And then I had a 10-man squad for Karn, who, you know, that's one of those things where I'm like, this is a very consistent unit that I enjoy playing. Karn is just phenomenal. He, he does so much work. Um, then I had the controversial choice of 10 Terminators. Uh, I didn't want 10 Terminators. I wanted six more Exalted 8 bands, but I didn't have them. Um, so yeah, 10 Terminators, 6 Exalted 8 Band, and 3 Exalted 8 Band, and a Rhino, and 2 Jackal Squads. Um, so that was the list. It was really cool, because, like, the kind of, it's hard to say, the concept around a lot of World Leader lists, at least when I'm talking in the Patreon chat and to Jamie and Jack, is we talk about these things called Hammer Units, which are basically, like, a unit in a world leader's list that can reliably pick up most targets that it charges. And in the Angron list, Angron is obviously a hammer, but generally you have like three to four hammers around him. In this list, I had five to six hammers in the list, which was really, really cool, depending on how I attach things. Um, so already I was kind of like, I feel like I have redundancy here. And I was just really interested to see how the Demon Prince was going to play, because... I had no idea if he was going to be good or bad, if I was going to pick the Oath of Corn target correctly, if the half damage was actually going to be as good on the table as I thought it would be. Um, and the Terminators as well was a really big call. You know, a, a unit that, even with our speed boost, is still slow in a relative sense. Um, and I, I didn't really value them beforehand. So they were the two big question marks about this list. So I went into the tournament with literally zero practice games and hopes and dreams. Um, so just before we go into those games, did the deck guard game at the LGT not go well from a gentleman's perspective? Uh, I think it was like fine. You know, it was it was like not really. I wouldn't have said that like there was any problems in that sense. Um, I think he he definitely wasn't happy when Angron resurrected, but like overall the game was fine. And I don't necessarily think that the mistakes he made were malicious. It was just there was quite a few mistakes that favored him. Um, and generally speaking, when that happens and they don't really make mistakes that don't favor them, things get a little bit suspicious. But like I can see how you would make the mistake with the sorcerer about powering up the unit and stuff like that. Um, the stuff about the armor save, about the blood drones having a two up, I'm less sure if you can make that mistake. But anyway, it doesn't really matter. Uh, Jay saying Macrolore is back. Macrolore is back. I brought Macrolore out, which I was really excited about. For anyone who um, knows the lore of my own warband, it's my, my demon prince. And I was just super stoked to get him back on the table. 
So yeah, I was really, really hyped about Broadsword. So Broadsword happens twice a year in Ireland. It's run by um, Broadsword YouTube channel, Broadsword Shop. Um, Ali and Kira, people probably know them. And it's run in Mayo, which is notoriously difficult to get to. It's like three and a half hours drive, um, which is probably nothing to most American viewers. But for, for Ireland, it's a lot. So we went up after a very stressful week in work where I was trying to get my PhD proposal prepared. Um, and we got there pretty late. So I went up with my buddy Jay, who I think is in chat, um, Michael, the Thousand Sons player, and Dan from um, Team Ireland. So it's it's my standard practice group. So Jay was bringing Death Guard, Michael was bringing Blood Angels, most importantly Sons of Sanguinius, and Dan was bringing um, an Obliterator CSM list. So that was really cool. We were all very, very excited about it. And I I was basically peer pressured in by the guys to actually go to this event. And I'm so glad that I did because it was tons of fun. So um, game one, I played into Oshin and his demons. This game was like really cool. Oshin had, what did he have? Uh, Demon Prince of Corn. So I was immediately like, oh my God, you too. He had um, Bellicor. He had Shalaxi, he had um, a Keeper of Secrets, and then a bunch of small demons, like the Blue Scribes, he had Blue Horrors, Nurglings, all the things that you'd expect to see, and a lot of Juggernauts, actually. Um, and the Juggernauts were, were kind of scary. Um, so, yeah, this game was really fun. I made a misplay immediately. I went first and got like overeager about my pregame moves and all that stuff. And I sent six Exalted Eight Bound into the Ten Horrors, which probably was like the worst mistake I've ever made in a 10th edition game of Warhammer. Because like, number one, they obviously couldn't kill all the Horrors because they split. And number two, even if they did, I was trading a squad of 300 point Exalted Eight Bound for like Horrors, which is like, okay, whatever. Um, so that was a really bad move. And as a result, I lost almost all the Eight Bounds, which was pretty rough. Um, and then the Terminators were kind of like waddling into the middle of the board, being like, okay, I guess we have to do primary now. Um, and it was really difficult to fight back from there because Shalaxi kind of came out to play and I failed like my charge of the Mo in turn. I failed my charge of Karn in turn. Um, so then I lost those units pretty swiftly as well, which was also kind of rough. Um, but my Demon Prince did drop in in his backline and go to town. He like went through quite a few units and, and almost killed Bellicor, who was the Oath of Corn target. Took him down to three wounds, which was sick. Um, and I played like a pretty tight game in this game. Like the Terminators just like held the middle of the board, but like kind of didn't really have anywhere to go until like turn four or turn five, where they started trying to pick up the greater demons. So I was able to kill um, Shalaxi. I was able to kill the Lord of Change. I was not able to kill Bellicor, which was problematic. And I killed a lot of other stuff. There were some nice blood surge moves that came off for me. Um, but ultimately, Oshin had a really good control of the Realm of Chaos strategy where you can kind of like pick things up and put them back down. Um, and he used that to great effect to basically score really well on the tacticals. Um, so the game finished 73-100 to Oshin. And like I didn't feel bad about it. I was kind of just like, yeah, he outplayed me. I made some bad moves early on and I paid for them. And I couldn't claw it back from there, try as hard as I might. Um... And at that point, I was kind of like, cool, um, it was an experimental list. It hasn't gone amazing so far. You know, at this point, I'm 0-1. I don't really care. Um, so then I played Connor and his Yanari, which was a really interesting Yanari list because it had um, a lot of Dark Elder and a lot of Harlequins and not a lot of actual Elder. It didn't have the Yincarn, which was pretty, pretty big. Um... But it had a lot of units that were quite difficult to to deal with. Um, so there was a lot of boats. There was a lot of Harlequin boats. And there was a lot of Dark Lances, which I was like, oh gosh. Uh, so I went first in this game, which was pretty nice. And I rushed pretty hard in this game. I rushed hard with the Exalted. I rushed the Terminators into the middle as well. And I rushed one flank particularly hard. So basically turned the pressure up to 11 um the exalted eight bound took out a bunch of stuff in their first turn charge the terminator is like i think they were okay in their shooting they might have killed like a cabalite squad or something but in response um connor actually picked up like i want to say eight or nine of the terminators with dark lance shooting even though i had cover 
and I was like, okay, cool, maybe I'll make some of the Feel No Pains. But the Feel No Pains on the Terminators is actually just really bad when it's only a six, compared to the Exalted who tanked the other half of the army's shooting and live with like two or three of them from the squad of six. Um, so yeah, you know, Terminators, what can I say? They were unimpressive in that game. Um, so basically they all died except for like two guys who were like, oh, now we're hitting on twos and plus one to wound. And I'm just like, I don't care. You guys can't do anything now. Um, but in my second turn, I basically counterattacked with like a lot of my berserkers. Some of them had Rappening Rest and some of them came out of Rhino. Um, and I basically took up most of his army in my turn two. Or so I thought because a lot of his army was actually still in reserve. So he basically flipped deployment zones. In his turn two, he brought in like a lot of reinforcements um, in my half of the board, which was really interesting. So I had a really strong like opening two turns, but then Connor started to kind of claw it back as well. Some tactical cards came up in his favor and then some tactical cards came up in my favor. And it got quite scrappy, but ultimately I think I was able to just run down Connor's resources before he was able to claw his way back into the game enough. So that game finished 80 to 74 to me. And it was a really, really fun game. Connor was a great opponent. And he played from a losing perspective, like, really well. Like, he did what he needed to do. His target priority was really good. Um, and his allocation of force to score points was really, really good, too. And that contributed to the score actually being quite close. Um, so that was game two. Then I played Mikey, who was bringing a Blood Angel gun line was like double gladiator repulsor um, aggressors two dreadnoughts like there was like so many clones of that list at the the event um crucially though it didn't have any screening and i went first and i was just like let's go um so basically i just gung hoed across the board uh the exalted eight bound um took a gladiator down to two wounds the terminators failed their charge it was like a six inch charge into the repulsor they just shit the bed Fail the charge. Um, then a bunch of aggressors and, and intercessors got out of that a repulsor and hosed the terminators, which was rough. But they did a good job actually surviving in that game. And they kind of just held an objective and held one flank up until reinforcements arrived in the form of Karn and his squad and Invocatus, who managed to take out that repulsor. Um, meanwhile, the Exalted Eight Bound, they. Um, yeah, the Gladiator was able to fall back there which was rough, and then the Exalted Ape Bone got taken down to, like, two guys, I think, um, who were then able to chase that Gladiator down and finish it off, while the rest of my army kind of came out of the woodwork. Um, so the Demon Prince came in, started doing a lot of work, and absorbed a ton of shooting in that game. Because of the half damage, he was so survivable, especially with the, the Feel No Pain as well. Um, and then the remaining Exalted Ape Bone came in as well, and they were super useful. So basically, the Terminator is kind of like, dammed up one flank and just like held it while they waited for Karen's squad and the rest to arrive meanwhile the other flank was just being swept by my really fast moving units so essentially what happens was I basically boxed in Mikey to the point where he just wasn't able to score and that was at a really early point in the game as well so it was pretty rough that game finished um 88 to 30 in my favor and yeah it was it was really tough like I I was just able to like hold in the area that I needed to hold and put insane pressure in the area that I needed to do that as well. And an awful lot of the reason why that was so successful is because the Demon Prince just dropped in, picked up his Ode of Core and Gladiator, stood in front of the gun line and just said, I'm going to half damage and I'm going to roll a few Feel No Pains and you're not going to kill me because I have cover. And yeah, it was just like, it was really cool to see him drop in and do the thing that I wanted him to do. And yeah, I was I was really pleased about how that one went. It was a good exercise in uh, the concept of the list, I think. It worked as I wanted it to work. Um, so then that was the end of day one in, in uh, Broadsword. We went out for drinks that night. We got back very, very late. It was like 2 a.m. by the time we got home. I went for, for drinks with some of my opponents and some of my some of the guys. And yeah, things got a bit rowdy and, and out of hand as they tend to do at Irish events. Um and I was playing into Guard the next day, which I was kind of like, this looks like the Imperial Guard version of the list that I just played. So maybe it'll be okay. And it was like, it was not as okay. I was like, I had such a headache, not from going out, but from like having to focus so hard on the Guard game, which was uh, five Lehman Ross, two of which were tank commanders, two Basilisks, Leontis, 
Gaunt's Ghosts, six Scout Sentinels, and some Bulgrin. Um, so I was just like, cool, I really, 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 really badly want to go first in this game, and I did not. I did not go first, which was pretty rough. Um, and Stefan did a really, really good job of basically pushing all the Sentinels in front of my face and saying, okay, cool, um, you're going to have to deal with all these now. And I was not able to deal with all of them. I picked up two of the squads and unfortunately the Terminators whiffed it. I was like, come on guys, you can you can surely kill two Sentinels. And they were like, nope, we can't, we can't kill these. Um, which was really rough. And yeah, that was that was basically that. Um I was able to pick up all the Sentinels and I picked up a Lehman Ross with Karen squad as well. Um I think it might blur is on. Let me see if I can get the autofocus going here. My bad. Um, but yeah, so there was a lot of pressure put on by Stefan in the first couple of turns, which basically was really annoying because the Sentinels were like coming back to life and the Lehman Russ were pushing out. But I was able to control the firing lanes pretty well. And once again, in this game, Macrolor just kind of like dropped down. I'm also, I'm sorry, guys. I don't know why the blur is, is not working. Um... But yeah, Macrolor basically dropped down and said like, hey, what's up? I'm going to absorb like the Imperial Guard gun line again, which was pretty cool. And the Exalted Ape Bound did a lot of work in this game um, because they actually ran into one Lehman Russ, um, which failed its leadership test, which is pretty likely to happen for Imperial Guard. So then they killed that Lehman Russ. They ran into another one. The same thing happened to kill that one as well. Um, meanwhile, the Terminators were kind of stuck in the middle of the board fighting like Bulgrin and stuff, which was like fine. They spent like two and a half turns in combat with Bulgrin, which was not ideal, I would say. Um, meanwhile, Karen went through to Lehman Ross by himself and Macrolor just dropped in, took out the tank commander who was his oath and then went into the, the Imperial Guard gun line, picked up the Basilisk, picked up Leontis and some other stuff. So... Where the Terminators were letting me down in that game by being unable to kill Sentinels and being unable to kill Bulgren, um, everyone else was showing up. And like it just really, really showed when Terminators were wounding a Lehman Ross on fives and Exalted Ape Bound were wounding it on threes. That was like the moment that kind of clicked in my head of being like, yeah, this is this is why I'm kind of leaning towards the Exalted over these guys. Um and even into things like Sentinels, where it's like, yeah, cool, this is like tough seven, you should be picking this up. But they're just really inconsistent because the weapon profiles are kind of strange across the whole unit. And yeah, I don't know. I really didn't enjoy them in that game. Um, Gaunt's Ghosts also just like appeared in my deployment zone and were an absolute nightmare for me to deal with for such a long period of time. Uh, and I eventually had to send the Glaive Mo back down there to deal with them. But the end of that game was basically I, I had tables, the Imperial Guards. Um, so it was fairly decent win. I won 99 to 82. But Stefan put up a really good fight, just causing me hassle in a lot of places. Gaunt's Ghosts got him probably, of those 82 points, I reckon Gaunt's Ghosts scored at least 35 of them. Maybe even more. Um, they were obnoxious. But yeah, that was that was a really tough game. I came out of that one like stressed and tired, being like, I had to really play very hard in that game. Um, but once again, it was carried by the the Terminators and... Or not the Terminators, carried by the Exalted and the Demon Prince who dropped in and absorbed like so much shooting. It was ridiculous. Um, Pardo, I see you saying that's the problem. I'm sending Terminators into vehicles. I was sending them into like... It was a mixed bag. When they went into like elite infantry, they were fine. Um, but into the vehicles, which, you know, are very present in the meta at the minute, they... They just weren't really doing the trick for me, unfortunately. Um, yeah, so so that was a little bit rough, I think, for them. Um, Termi Strength 10 is good into vehicles. Yes, until they become Toughness 11, and then the Exalted 8 band just really come out on top in that in that fight. Um, but yeah, that was that was game four. So at this point, I'm 3-1, and one, and I'm playing into Fran, my first ever competitive warhammer opponent at any tournament and he's bringing his sisters which was really cool um this game was was really fun because i was like really excited to play against fran he has a gorgeously painted sisters of battle army so that was hype but um yeah fran took engage on all fronts and deploy teleport homers which telegraphed pretty hard to me 
what he wanted to do. And I made the decision at the start of the game that if I essentially sacrifice my army across the first three turns to box him into the table quarter deployments that he had, um, I would win the game because I'd basically zero him on engage and almost zero him on deploy teleport homers. Um, and I did that. I went first and I launched the Terminators forward. I launched some Berserkers forward. They dealt with all the screen, um, which was fine. I only wanted them to kill the screen. That's why I sent five Berserkers forward. And I just stood the Terminators in front of his deployment zone. And I said, can you kill 10 Terminators in cover in one turn? Um, and he killed nine of them, which was nuts. Like the Terminators in this game did what I needed them to do. And because he had to put the entire gun line into those Terminators, my second wave hit like a freight train. I had Exalted 8 Band coming in. I had Karen and his guys coming in. Um, the one remaining Terminator just went on an absolute bender and killed a load of things as well. Um, yeah, I was able to basically keep up an insane amount of pressure for the first three turns of that game. And the outcome of that was by the time that Fran was actually dropping in things like the Assassin and the Demonifuge to score his secondaries, I was picking them off with things like uh, the Demon Prince who dropped in, things like Jackals, small Berserker squads. And I had hemmed in and essentially eliminated most of the high level threats from the sisters. So the Glaive mode just showed up in this game, walked through Morven Val, walked through the Triumph of St. Catherine, walked through a Zephyrim squad, eventually got to an Exorcist. And I was just like, dude, you're showing off in a big way. The Exalted 8 Band were really big too. They, um, they took out an Immolator quite quickly and all the sisters inside there as well which was really good um so the outcome of that game was basically i just pushed insanely hard on the flanks while i maintained a hold in the center and because of that push fran was just unable to push out of the deployment zone which meant he wasn't able to score and then obviously conversely i was getting a lot of the tactical missions coming up in my favor and i was scoring really high on the primary as well so being able to apply that level of pressure was really interesting and really fun it was a huge gamble but it paid off in a big big way so i was able to win that game 90 to 51 which secured a four and one um overall in broadsword and fifth place out of uh, i think around 60 players which was really really cool and i was really happy about it and as a proof of concept tournament for a non-angron list that brought units which a lot of people consider unconventional i was really 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 proud of myself for what i did um i thought it was a really good result so let me just catch up with chat here before i do anything else if you guys want to ask questions about broadsword now is the time as well um po -po 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 -po. man wins game terminators didn't do shit that was literally me all weekend they would do stuff and i'd be like man you guys are shit i just wanted them to be bad um and like in fairness they were really good in the sisters game because they absorbed all that firepower and they were pretty good in the Ultramarine or in the Blood Angels gunline game because they just kind of held that flank, held that one objective. Um, yeah, the anti-vehicle in my local meta was was really important to get. Like there was this tournament was like predominantly heavy vehicles, and I felt that. Um, and Exalted is better in that sense. How does it do versus Deck Guard? My new list. I'm not sure. Um, I'm due to play Jay probably pretty soon with a very, very nasty deck guard. Um, I think overall, it's really hard to say. It depends on, like, they, it'll really suffer from the minus weapon skill if you put that up. Um, how many turns of shooting would the Prince last for? It really depended. A lot of the times he survived the entire game. The Brazen Helm was really good. Like, I can't say that enough. The Brazen Helm was the thing that surprised me the most like it was super resilient for the demon prince like he did things that he shouldn't have been able to do because of that and i think i was definitely being like okay cool if the brazen helm doesn't show off i'll probably take the berserker glaive on him but it really did show up and i'm definitely going to keep the brazen helm on him in the future because that with the feel no pain is really strong and if you're going into a combat army you can do the minus one damage as well which is um is really rude i would say um so before i move on to any other stream questions i have some discord questions from earlier today as well which i will quickly run through about um essentially a few things that were asked about the list so um bum, 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 bum. 
what is going on here um so from iron dan he, he was wondering how i use the prints so i think i've covered a lot of how i use the prints in this already selecting the target pregame is is quite difficult to do i think a lot of um this tournament was actually working out what the prince could and couldn't kill i found out pretty quickly he's good at killing like medium-sized tanks like gladiators lehman russ he is not good at killing bellicor i got really lucky to take bellicor down to three wounds i would not do that again so i think the prince is best suited not targeting like the most important thing in your enemy's army unless you have the berserker glaive on him but rather targeting a medium level threat and then being a nuisance for the rest of the game um how did i move the prince around the board every single game started him in deep strike and ingressed him um so that was him how did the termies work i think from in or sorry insane for terrain um insane for rain even yeah, I think I've elaborated. The Terminators didn't work very, very well. Um, I am dropping them from the list, and I'm going to add more Exalted 8-Bound, and probably Skulltaker as well, I think is something I'm looking at. So that's that. Um, if I was to start playing Demons, what list would I be interested in trying? Pretty much what Oshin brought against me, a couple of greater Demons, and a lot of small dudes who can just run around the board and be a nuisance. I would probably lean pretty heavily into Zinch um, with a nice amount of Korn and a nice amount of Slanesh and maybe a great unclean one because those guys look like a ton of fun to play against as well. So Queen of Spawn says, what benefits do I see to running a non-Angron army? Um, I think it gives you like that little bit of redundancy, which the Angron list doesn't necessarily have. It also doesn't rely on the Blood Dice resurrecting Angron, which I think is really, really important. It doesn't telegraph to your opponent what you want to do as well when you put anger on the board it's generally quite clear against a decent opponent it's like okay cool this is what this person wants to do and what they're planning on doing it's a lot harder to predict what a wing demon prince in deep strike which can be rapid ingress what he's going to do i know you slightly telegraph by picking the oath of corn but it's a lot less obvious um in terms of what he wants to do so I really enjoy the psyops that it brings to the table. I enjoy the extra redundancy that you don't necessarily get with Angron. Um, and I just really enjoyed the Demon Prince. I was like shocked at how resilient he could be with the Brazen Helm. So that is that from Queen of Spawns. Um, what else do we have here? From Telemachus. Since I was attempting to transfer to a non-Ronald's competitive list, what play style or play pattern am I beginning to lean into? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I think speed and pressure is something that I am now definitely leaning into. Um, mainly because like this list was able to just really turn on a massive amount of pressure early on in the game. When the Angron list couldn't necessarily do that as well. Um, I found that my opponents struggled a lot more with Exalted 8-Band than I necessarily expected them to which was really, really cool as well. And with the Feel No Pain booster on them, I think they can be really troublesome. So I think the play pattern that this is leaning me into is playing around more with the um, with the Exalted, adding more of them in and taking the Terminators out and just playing really high speed, really high aggression and exceptional pressure as well, I think is the main thing, um, which suits my play style, I would say, overall. So that is that. What have we got going on in the chat here? Um, camera's out of focus again. Yes, I am sorry. It is being really annoying with me tonight. It's probably pissed off that I haven't streamed in a long time. So, Gabriel, you've been considering the footprints for me are for instead of the Winged Demon Prince? Yeah, I can see him being really good. I really like the deep strike on the Winged Demon Prince. I think that's like the big take-home point for me. The ability to ingress and just kind of like show up. Um... There's not really too much of a difference in terms of maneuverability between the two. The winged one, I definitely did fly over a few buildings this weekend, which was like obviously something the footprints can't really do. Uh, but the footprints having dev wounds on the charge makes the berserker glaive really interesting on him. Like the footprints can go to four damage sweeps with dev wounds on the charge is what I would say about him with the berserker glaive, which is quite scary. Um, but yeah, I think overall, like, it's given me so much interesting perspective on things that I want to do with world leaders now that aren't Angron list, and I don't see myself running Angron for, like, quite a considerable few months now. 
Um, definitely not for Coventry. I will be running probably something along these lines. But that is pretty much it. That has been my experience of majors, LGT, super major, all that good stuff over the last couple of weeks. I know it's been a little bit quiet on the Red Pat. We've all been kind of uh, recovering from our tournaments and things like that. And there's a lot of real life stuff going on as well. Hopefully Jamie and Jack will be able to do something similar for their experience of the LGT as well. I'm sure you folks would love to hear from them. But I said since I was the most free this week that I would update everyone with uh, my ridiculous 13 games in seven days, which was tiring, but ultimately very, very fun. Um, if there's any last questions before we get off, um, I will answer them now. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. In Europe, it seems that people build coherent armies with a good amount of vehicles. Meanwhile, US statesmen are running the beach on D-Day. <laughs> yeah, um, it depends, I think. Like, sometimes the European meta kind of swings pretty hard into that as well. But I think overall, there's like a weird thing in Europe where people are kind of like always trying to like outthink each other with meta lists. Like, I was like trying to outthink myself a broadsword by not bringing Angron and it definitely like freaked people out like I would get up to the table and they would say like where's Angron and I'm like I'm, I'm not bringing him and they were really unsure how to deal with that I think that was like the big takeaway as well and people just not being ready for the demon prince taking way more damage than he should have to kill um yeah it really confused people so I think that it does kind of play into the European overall meta has my playstyle changed from alpha striking your opponent? A little bit, yeah. I think in general now, I'm not really like alpha striking them. I'm hitting them with generally one or two units in the first turn, which isn't doing a crazy amount of damage. But my playstyle is changing one to more of like zone control, where by moving those units in the first turn and by moving other units around them, I'm basically positioning in ways where if they push out, they're going to be hit by a really, really hard counterattack in my turn two and boxing them in. Um, so I think I'm, I'm really enjoying and leaning into more of a zone control play style, which I haven't really played in so many words before. I was always kind of playing the multiple wave um, style of world leaders, which I am still definitely playing with this list, but I'm using it in a way to zone out my opponent from the areas around the map which are very important and I think that's not necessarily a list change thing that's kind of caused that shift but rather me playing a new army which has caused me to have to get better and understand how to play the mission better as well um, is my opinion on that but yeah I think that is pretty much that um, that about covers the two events anyway I had a ton of fun over the last couple of weeks like playing a stupid amount of Warhammer and I'm really looking forward to Coventry, which is coming up in November. So if any of you folks are planning on going to the Coventry Super Major, I will be there. I think Jack is going to be there as well. Um, and it's going to be tons of fun. I'll be running a non-Angron list, probably a variation of this, which uh, I think some of you in the Patreon comp channel in Discord have already seen. So another great reason to join the Patreon, if you haven't already, you can get access to um, insight into like what we're thinking about in terms of lists coming up and, and get your own advice in there as well. Um, and as always, obviously, you know, support the channel in, in kind of whatever way you can. Likes, comments, subscribes, all that good stuff. Um, what is... Oh yeah, Gabriel Pardo for the Sentinels, numerous T6 units. Yeah, the Sentinels were obnoxious. I think, like, the list started with, like, 6. And I think in total it ended up with 12 because of the amount of them that resurrected. It was so annoying. <laughs> that card game, I was just like... I had a migraine after that game. It was so tough. Um, but yeah, so thanks so much everyone for hanging out in chat and chatting away. Um, I hope you found the stream interesting and, you know, leave a comment down below if you enjoyed it. Thanks for the super chats, help support the channel, all that good stuff. And you'll be hearing from me, Jamie and Jack very soon. Painting streams are going to be back from next week on Twitch. So make sure you're subscribed and following our channel for that. So you can see me painting, um, what will be some very interesting alternative eight band models that I'm working on for Coventry. Um, but until the next one, folks, I've been Dara and you've been watching The Red Path. So stay healthy, stay safe and kill, maim, burn.